welcome to your very own 9th and 10th channel. I'm Aishwarya and our class today is going to be a very interesting class on the human brain and the spinal cord where we are going to be learning about its structure, its function and we are going to be visualizing it in 3D and we will be understanding it using a model as well. So we're going to have a thorough understanding so that after this class I am very sure that you will never forget the structure of the brain and its functions. So welcome to everyone who are here in the class. My screen is on the side so please don't mind if I'm looking you know cross direction there. So I can see a lot of you are here. I have Yash, Vaibhavi, Ishwari, Mohammed. Yes, I am amazing. How are all of you? You've had a very exciting day. You had a very exciting mentee class as well with Saurabh sir. So I hope all of you are recharged for today's session. Hello Tanvi, Aarti, Tanisha, Harsh. Yes, all right. I'm amazing seeing you all after a very long time. Ankita Mam is doing really well, right? She's all fine. Yes, all right. So will we be doing Menti for Control by 15th of September? Yes, of course. So the plan is of course to wrap up control and coordination as soon as possible. So do not worry. That is why we are having classes back to back so that you have a good conceptual understanding about, of this chapter. Because you see at one go when you look at this chapter, it can seem tricky. It can be a little tricky, which is why we are going patiently with it so that you have good conceptual clarity. And once you have that conceptual clarity, I am very sure that all of you will be able to you know crack your exams really well especially when you you know we're talking about your board exams you will be able to do it right okay everyone before I get started I hope my audio my video and my screen and what I am writing on the screen is visible yes quickly give me a thumbs up on the chat so that I know that we are good to go all right, very good. And make sure that you have your notebook and pens with you or if not, please have your textbooks with you as well so that you can make a note of your pointers in the textbook, yes? Okay, I can see that currently we have around 32 live watching but very quickly, please tell all your friends to be a part of this class. It will definitely be helpful for all of them. Yes, all right. Now, of course, I'm sure this is something that you have been constantly seeing throughout our sessions on who is the champion in our life? And I'm sure that at some point, you know, we call you our champions. Yes, but of course, you know that it's your parents who are making you the champions that you are. Yes. So now, of course, you have a chance to win and get a trip to Australia, you along with your legal guardian or parent, by enrolling for the Baiju scholarship test, yes? So the last date is on 4th of September, the last exam for round one is happening then, so please make sure that all of you are registered, because you win a lot of exciting opportunities. After this, you have round two, of course, but on clearing and processing the results, three lucky students will win the trip to Australia, and the others, of course, who clarify or who, you know, sort of qualify for the results, they will be winning a scholarship yes so do not forget to register for the BST because the last exam is happening on 4th so promise me all of you are going to be registering for this yes and of course before I get started I'm sure that you've been hearing about Baiju's Excel masterclass right now before I get started of course here's a quick video on the same so that you know what happens on the masterclass all right then, so I think the video is not playing, but let me tell you a little bit. So in Baiju's masterclass, of course, what happens is that we bring in some experts on topics and we take you through the experience of what it is, right? And this uh, Sunday, we have a topic on sensors and of course, it is going to be extremely interesting. So do not forget to, you know, register for this. All you need to do is to go to byjuicexcel.com. So the link is there in the description as well. So you've already watched it. Well and good. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, Yash is really going to be helping me. So guys, now that I've told you about some of the important things, we're going to get started. Yes, of course, Aura, we will recap it towards the end if you don't mind. We'll do a quick recap towards the end, right? Because today's class is going to be very heavy in terms of understanding the structure of the brain. Now, how many of, how much, for how many of you does this happen? During the exam, when you want to think, okay, I need to remember the answer for this particular physics question. But our brain is singing some random song, our favorite song, it's singing like this, right? But at the same time, 
after walking right out of the exam, we will remember the answer, right? And then you must be thinking, what is this? Why is our brain not working when we need to work? How many of you have felt this? Yes, Darde <laughs> Yeah, some of the songs that happen in Darde Disco, yes. It has happened to me when I was in school, right? It's very normal for this to happen, right? Yes, I can see that a lot of you are telling me that it happens to you. Yes, very good, very good. All right. So now this is very common. And that's because our brain that is there actually has a trick. And it's called as a mind blank trick. And sometimes when there's a threat or when we feel overly stressed, right? Our brain will just wipe it clean and be like, no, now you're not going to think too much about it, right? So I think that, you know, this is something that happens to most of us, yes? All right, Tanisha has just come to class, not a problem. We are, of course, just getting started. Now, I'm going to start off with some interesting activities to actually let you know how much your brain does, right? Or how complex your brain is. Now, normally, our brain is already trained over a period of time, right? We associate a lot of things, for example, certain words with certain colors, with certain, you know, maybe shapes that are there. We do this most often. So I have a quick activity before, of course, I get started with all the important information for your boards. Here's a quick activity for all of you. You have 10 seconds and you need to tell me which will you match with what, right? So you need to place the letters inside the envelope based on the color and not the word, right? So your time starts now, yes? So take 10 seconds and try to match it in your heads itself. You do not need to let me know in the chat, but I want you to quickly tell me. All right. How many of you were able to do this in 10 seconds? Be very honest. Were you able to do this in 10 seconds? Like in your mind when you're trying to match it? You were able to do it. That's amazing. Yes. All right. Nibha did it. Aditi did it. Tanisha did it. Very good. Now, can I ask you a question? Muskan said, no. That's normal. Right? If you guys feel like I have not been able to do it, I could not do this activity, it happens. And I'll tell you why. That's because our brain that is there, which is so amazing and complex, does a lot of things. It associates with our surroundings, right? Yes, I was confused for a second. Yes. So if you see, right, in all of these cases, so far when we spoke about, you know, the exam, or take this activity for example, see how you are using your brain on, for all of this. Your brain is processing so much information and it is able to tell you what needs to be done. But when it is a little out of the ordinary, your brain is stopping and saying, okay, wait, let me see, this is something very new, right? In 15 to 18 seconds itself, yes, it takes a while for all of this. So now, of course, we have all of these activities that are there. Yes, you can put it across in different, different boxes. So now, very quickly, this was a simple activity and I'll come back to the second activity after I finish the nervous system, yes? So now, of course, so far with Ankita ma'am, you have learned about the basics, right? You've learned about what are neurons, how signal transduction or signal transmission takes place. And you've learned about the reflex arc. And of course, you've learned about the nervous system in general and how they can be categorized, right? So broadly, we know as a quick summary, I will tell you that nervous system can be categorized into central nervous system or CNS and peripheral nervous system or PNS, right? And we see that the central nervous system can be categorized into brain and spinal cord, yes? So now we will focus on today's class on this particular part mainly, that is the brain and the spinal cord. Now, if you talk about the brain and the spinal cord, we saw so much about, we did these activities and we know that these are the primary controlling systems in our body, right? They are responsible for a lot of control and coordination that is taking place inside our body. Now, we call it a central nervous system because they are centrally present in our body, right? So if you talk about the brain, it's present in the head region and spinal cord, of course, runs perpendicular to it or you can say that it is present in the back region, right? Are we clear so far, everybody? Are we clear? Very quickly, give me a thumbs up. Yes? All right, everyone, very quickly, give me a thumbs up. Okay, very good, very good. Yes. So now, of course, when
when we talk about the brain and the spinal cord, we need to first talk about its location, right? So we know that the brain is present in the head, right, or in the head region. And like I told you, spinal cord is there in the back region. Now, because they are such important organs, the brain and the spinal cord, we see that they are protected by a bony encasing. So this is, first we will talk about how they are protected, yes? So we see that the brain is protected inside the skull in a region known as the cranium, which we also call as brain box, right? So this is what we mean by it. Now next up, when we talk about the spinal cord, we see that the spinal cord runs downwards like this from the brain and it is protected by the vertebral column, right? So this is how they are protected externally. But this alone is not enough. We see that they are also surrounded by membranous coverings. Very good. These membranous coverings, like how Aditi has told us, are known as meninges. Now meninges in turn, so I'm just going to quickly write it down. Meninges in turn is made up of three membranes, right? So you have one, two and three. And this is what surrounds both the brain as well as the spinal cord, right? Yes, the vertebral column is also known as the backbone of our body. Now, of course, if I'm not going into the details of it, even though it is there, but the three names, it could be useful for you if you want to write it down. But for your exam point of view, this is not necessary. We have the three membranes. Their names are dura mater, arachnoid mater and pia mater. Yes. So this is just some extra information, which is the three membranes of, that makes up the meninges. Yes. Now, one thing to understand is that between the meninges, which is the three layered protective covering, we find a fluid, right? And this fluid is called as the cerebrospinal fluid. Very, very important. Oops, I think something went wrong. Just give me a minute. Right. I will repeat it once again. Don't worry. I'll just quickly wind this up, right? So here, as you can see, we have the cerebrospinal fluid, which is present between each of the membranes. And this is very important because if you see, this fluid is responsible for absorbing shocks and jerks and it protects your central nervous system. And of course, it supplies food and oxygen to different parts. Yes. So let me repeat this once again, right? So yes, both your brain and spinal cord are protected by a bony encasing as you see here, which is called as the cranium. So brain is protected inside the cranium, which is known as brain, you know, brain box. And your spinal cord is protected in the vertebral column. Now, apart from having a skeletal hard rigid protection, they also have a membranous protection here. So as you can see here, this membranous protection is what we call as meninges. So you can think of it as three layers covering it, right? And we see that the three layers have names and I just have it on screen, which is dura matter, pia matter and arachnoid matter, right? So it's very simple. You don't need to worry too much about it. You just need to know that they are called as meninges, right? And between each of these layers, right? So if you see right here, between these layers, you will find your cerebrospinal fluid, which absorbs mechanical shocks. Yes. So for example, when we fall down, right, that is there. Or sometimes when we get hit, maybe for example, if somebody throws something, maybe a ball at my back, that creates a shock, right? The impact gets created. And as a result, we see that they get absorbed. So they absorb the shock so that nothing gets damaged on the inside, right? And of course, we see that keep the CNS moist and supply, supplies food and oxygen to different parts. Now, brain trauma that is there. So trauma can be caused maybe due to some injury that happens, right? So or it can be psychological as well. And that is trauma is when it is not at ease, when there is some disturbance. Yes. So are we clear with this on how the protection of CNS takes place? Two points to remember. There is bone, three points actually. Bony encasing, you should remember brain box and vertebral column, cerebrospinal fluid and meninges. Are we clear? Yes. Very good, everybody. Very good. Yes. All right. Now we will move on to the next one, right? Okay. Very good. So now we will move on to the next part of it, which is to understand the structure of the brain. Yes. So now when we talk about the brain, 
Normally we say that the brain is almost like a computer processing all of this information that comes into the body. But let me tell you, the brain is far superior than a supercomputer also that you will find in on the world. I am telling you, I do not think we have anything which is nearly close to how the brain works and functions. And even now, if you see, there is so much research done on how to understand how exactly we are able to do a lot of things, right? Which is why the brain is a very, very interesting and it's a very unique thing that makes us who we are. Yes, it stores a lot of things inside it. It processes a lot of information. As a matter of fact, if you were to take all the information that we have inside our heads and put it on CDs and DVDs, right? We would need like thousands. I would say we don't even need thousands. We'll need so much more of it. Yes, very good. It is divided into three parts. What is the size of the brain? Now see, size can be measured in so many ways. But if you see weight wise, it's around three pounds, you could say, right? So around three pounds and it's like pretty big. Yes. And if you see inside the brain alone, you would find around 10 million, right? So you, I mean, 100 billion neurons. I'm very sorry. That's a very small number that I told you. The brain alone has around 100 billion neurons. And apart from this, our brain also utilizes 20% of the oxygen that we take in. Yes, because our, it requires, right? It's processing so much information, so it needs that energy. Which is why almost, I would say even a little more, almost 20% of oxygen goes directly to the brain. Now, of course, we're quickly going to jump into the structure of the brain. And just like how all of you were telling me, there are three parts to the brain. There's forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain. Now, how many of you can tell me what is the basis of saying forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain? Yes? Yes, very good. Why are there curves in the brain? I am going to be telling you, Yashin, just a bit. Yes? All right. Very good. 100 billion neuron in convert... <laughs> there are many billion neurons are, I would say, in crores and crores, I would say. Based on position. Very good. Yes. 1 billion is how much? Around 100 crores. Roughly, I am not that good at conversion, but roughly a little more than 100 crores, maybe. Yes, thank you so much. Very good. Cerebrum is the biggest part. Yes. Now, of course, like you said, the whole categorization of forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain is based on the position. Now, one thing I will tell you maybe that you would have not heard otherwise, right? And this is a little extra, but this is just a basis for your understanding. Now, when you say that forebrain is the front part or the, you know, it is present in the front region, midbrain is in the middle and hindbrain is at the back region. It is not based on how they are present right now. Okay. It's actually based on when the embryo, so when we are young embryos and when our brain is developing, right? We see that there are three regions like this. So I'm going to quickly draw it. Our brain would look something like this. It would just look something of this sort. And this front part is what will develop into the forebrain that includes your cerebrum. Then this part in the middle is what actually make, develops into your midbrain, hence the name. And this part at the back is your hindbrain, right? And that is why we have cerebellum, pons, medulla oblongata, which all come under the hindbrain. Yes? So that is the reason why all of these parts come in forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain. Little extra, but always good to know as to why this is happening or why we are saying forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain. Yes? Now, of course, when we talk about forebrain, midbrain and hindbrain, I used a lot of other words, right? I used words like cerebrum, cerebellum, medulla. Then we had, you know, pawns. So many names that are there. How are these parts joined, right? Now, I know a lot of you are wondering how, where these parts come. I mean, all that we see and you can tell me yes or no, right? We only see this kind of an image, right? That you see on screen. But how many of you wonder, ma'am, I really want to know where exactly all of this comes in, right? How many of you wonder if you could really know its position, then it would really help you study better? Yes? How many of you feel that way? Yes, very good. I can see that a lot of you are telling me this. 
Yes, very good, very good. This happens and it's normal only because see when I was also a student and I was studying about the brain, I could not follow half of it. Then later on I'm like, okay, I need to know more. But then again, my visualization was not very good, right? Which is why we are here for you, right? What is this study of brain known as? The study of whole nervous system and all of this is what we call as neuroscience, right? The whole branch of it comes in neuroscience. Which is why what I'm going to do is I am going to be telling you the structure first, right? So I'm going to tell you the structure of the brain using a software and then we will switch to functions and understanding about it. Are we clear? Yes? PNS stands for peripheral nervous system. So can we switch to the software please? Yes, everybody, are you able to see my screen now? Yes, everything is good to go. So they were setting this up and that is why in between I went missing, right? So this, of course, what you see is a human anatomy and physiology software that I'm going to be using to help you visualize what is the brain, right? And what is the structure of the brain? So are we clear? So now, as you can see, with the help of this software, I will be able to move it around, right? I will be able to zoom parts of the brain and actually show it to you so that you will never forget where which part is, right? That's why I told you this with this session, you will be able to visualize different parts of it. Now, first up, let us start with the forebrain. Now, like I told you, forebrain is the front part of it, right? Now, the front part of the forebrain includes your cerebrum. So, let me adjust it on my screen so that you can see. Now, the part that I have highlighted here is the cerebrum. Now, this is the side view that you are seeing. But cerebrum makes up the largest portion. Almost up to 70-80% of the brain is just the cerebrum, right? And if you look at the top view, right? So, I'm going to do a top view as well and align it for all of you. Are you all able to see? Yes. Now, if you look at the top view of the brain, yes, we see that there are two structures. We see that it is highlighting in two parts. I can highlight one part alone here. I think only one single part has got highlighted. So not a problem. But if you see, you can highlight all of these different parts together. So let me just multi-select it so that you can see well. So now can you see I've highlighted one portion. This is what you call as a hemisphere that is there. So we call this as a cerebral hemisphere. And we have two. We have one on the right and we have one on the left. So this is what is the cerebral hemisphere that makes up the main part, right? It makes up the forebrain that is there. Are we clear so far? It is three pounds that is there. So we have left hemisphere and we have right hemisphere. And we see that these two hemispheres are connected to each other with the help of a structure known as corpus callosum. Alright, so this is the basic structure of the brain. Why are there many curves? Now, this is a very interesting question. Let me just realign it. So it, it takes me a little while to adjust it. Okay, so please be patient with it. Okay, all right. Oops, it's going everywhere now. <laughs> yes. So now a lot of you are asking me, why are there so many grooves on the screen, right? Or why do we see so many grooves on the brain? Now, in the cerebrum, we see that there is something known as ridges and grooves. 
Now these foldings that you see on the brain are actually to accommodate the neurons that make up the brain. So in order to accommodate a large number of neurons, we see that they are folded into ridges and grooves. So curves are nothing but ridges and grooves, yes? And of course we see that there is an arrangement of the neurons as well. We have grey matter and white matter. Now I am not going into too much details of it because you don't need to know. You only need to know that there is on the outer side we have the grey matter and on the inner side we have the white matter. Very quickly I am going to go once again with the structure. This what you see on screen is your cerebrum, right? So I'm going to quickly zoom, it's zooming in by itself because that's how the software is. So what you see on your screen and what is highlighted on blue is the cerebrum. Now cerebrum makes up a majority portion of your forebrain, right? And we have the cerebral hemispheres that is there, yes? Now of course when we talk about the cerebral hemispheres, we know that there's right hemisphere, left hemisphere which are connected by your corpus callosum. Alright, and of course we see that this right here plays a very important function. Now I do not want to go into the details of it because I'll tell you once again, but mainly it's our sight of thinking. We see that a lot of sensory functions are regulated such as hearing, touch, smell, sight, right? And of course we see that a lot of other functions, cognitive functions. So what do I mean by cognitive? Very fancy word. Cognitive is nothing but higher orders, you know, like for example, memory problem solving, critical thinking. These are all things that are done by this cerebrum, cerebrum that is there. Right? Are we clear so far? How are they divided from each other? Why don't we see that? So let me quickly go. So this is a cross section that you see on your screen of the brain. So they are divided in a way. So when you say they are divided, it's in a way where it's split into half, right? And this portion that I've highlighted in blue, that is your corpus callosum. So it's a fiber like, a lot of fiber like structure that is there which will attach it together. Yes? All right. Very good everybody. So far are we clear with cerebrum and its function? My name is Aishwarya. A lot of you are seeing me for the first time. So my name is Aishwarya. Yes? Are we clear with the role of cerebrum? Why do they need to divide? Now that's a very interesting question. Now if you see the left and right hemispheres that are there, right, and especially different parts of the brain, they carry out different functions. So we say that the left side regulates a lot of functions and we say, you know, most often you hear the left side of your brain actually regulates the functioning of the right side of your body and all of that. So basically us as complex living organisms, we have this kind of an organization where these two hemispheres are there. And that's why we are able to carry out, you know, such functions. That is why you can say that it's for the kind of functions that we do. Yes? All right. Are we clear everyone with cerebrum? Yes. All right. Very good everybody. Give me a quick thumbs up. Okay. Now we are going to move on to next two parts that I am going to highlight which will be there and I am sure you would have seen it in your, um, what do you say, you would have seen it in your textbook for sure. So let me just remove this part so that you can see this clearly, right? Okay, let me just realign this. Let's hide this. Okay. Now the portion that I have zoomed on here is your hypothalamus, right? Now the hypothalamus is what is there is of course part of your forebrain, yes? And it's in the front region as you can see and it regulates a lot of function like, like thirst, body temperature and so on, right? And of course apart from that we have another structure that is there. So can you see this part? It's on the inside. It's not very visible, yes? This part that you see on the inside is your thalamus, right? And thalamus acts as a relay point. It relays information to different parts of the forebrain, right? So you have your thalamus and you have your hypothalamus. And apart from that, at the base of the brain, if you see here, we have our pituitary gland that is there, yes? So let me quickly highlight that part so that you can see this. All right. Okay, I think in this part it's not very clearly visible, but we'll look at the pituitary gland very soon. So this is, a, this is all about the forebrain that is there. Where is the hypothalamus? The hypothalamus is not visible from the whole brain structure, but it is on the inside. The part that I have highlighted is the hypothalamus. Are we clear? What type of chemical is present in the neuron? 
so neuron has something known as neurotransmitters which help in transmitting signals yes okay all right now let's move on to the next part which is the midbrain now midbrain as you can see is in the middle region here yes now again if you take a whole brain and you have a look at it right you will not be able to see this yes so this right here is the midbrain and it's in the middle region can you see i have zoomed in so much and that's why you're able to see the midbrain right now the midbrain again acts as a relay point that is there and it is also responsible for regulating various reflex actions such as reflexes of the eye right like the change in pupil size change in lens size these are all responsible for or it's controlled by the midbrain yes so are we clear with the role of midbrain and its location yes very good it's at the base of the hypothalamus i will show you where the pituitary gland is it's a little difficult to navigate with this software so i'm trying my best as well now we have the hind brain now the hind brain that is there is present on the back region and it includes three things write this down very important it includes your cerebellum very different from your cerebrum it includes your cerebellum it includes your pons and your medulla right now all of you are asking me ma'am where is pons this what i have highlighted here which is present actually at the base of the midbrain just below it if you see is the pons right now difference between hypothalamus and midbrain i will tell you in just a bit yes all right so i am just going to take your doubts once i finish the explanation so i need your focus for 5 minutes yes you have your pons which again acts as your relay point and it coordinates or it connects different parts such as your forebrain it connects your med your cerebellum connects different parts that is there so again one point is coordination secondly pons is also responsible for regulating the respiration and the breathing patterns that are there right so two functions of pons now let's move on to the next part which is the cerebellum that is there right so i'm going to highlight the cerebellum and as you can see the cerebellum is the second largest part of the brain so let me just keep it here right so the cerebellum that you see on your screen is the second largest part and we also call it as little brain so cerebrum is the biggest part followed by which we have cerebellum yes and of course the cerebellum is responsible for coordinating various activities various muscular activities maintaining our body posture if you are able to sit watch this video i am able to stand and watch you know teach all of you it's because of our cerebellum right and last but not the least we have our medulla oblongata so i'm going to do it on this side are we able to see the medulla let me just move it on top yes so what you see right here that is extending from the bottom is your medulla oblongata or your medulla and this is very very important to our body because this small part that you see in our brain actually is responsible for regulating so many important involuntary functions involuntary actions are those actions that you cannot control right it cannot be controlled by you but rather it will be regulated by the brain specifically your medulla oblongata and we see that it regulates heart beat very good yash it regulates swallowing movement through the alimentary canal these are all some of the involuntary functions that we don't think about but of course we see that it helps in controlling it i am explaining the functions of the medulla oblongata yes and we see that this right here will extend down to form the spinal cord all right yes all right everybody all right so now we have visualized the brain right we have visualized what it is and now what we are going to do is we are going to quickly recall it so that you can write it down now size of the brain again i'm telling you in terms of how big it is right like when i talk about it it's again very relative yes so i would tell you that it would be again it's very difficult for me to tell i could tell you the weight of the brain which is around 3 pounds right involuntary i don't understand tanisha i will tell you in just a bit yes very good they connect brain to spinal cord ankita ma'am has already taken a class on tissues you can go check the video out yes all right crazy gamer are we clear everybody now are you able to visualize these parts better when you say hypothalamus is present here or cerebellum is present here are you able to see it better are you able to visualize this better
Yes. And for those of you who are asking me where the pituitary gland is, I'm just going to highlight it. I just have to multi-select it, right? So this that I've highlighted in blue, this right here is the pituitary gland that you see as it is present on the base of the brain. Small P-shaped gland which is present at the base of the brain. Yes? Very good. So now we're going to quickly switch back. You can keep me on the screen itself this time. So we'll switch back and we'll quickly recall all the important pointers so that you can make a note in your textbook, right? Okay, so they're going to keep a blank screen. So just give me one minute, all right? Okay, all right. So they're just setting me up. So in the meanwhile, as they do it, you know, we can discuss. So you were asking me which software this is. This is the anatomy and physiology software. All right. Size wise, Ranjan is saying it's around 5.5 into 6.5 into 3.5 inches. See, again, it's a very relative thing. It's an average one, you could say. All right. So now, very quickly, I'm going to take some of the questions that I see, right? First and foremost, I am seeing one very important question that I have to answer that is involuntary. Now, involuntary actions are those actions which cannot be controlled by our body, right? So we cannot control them, yes? And, but it is controlled by the brain, which means that if we decide that our heart should beat faster or slower, we cannot control it. That means we cannot consciously control it, yes? But at the same time, it will still be regulated by the brain. All right. So that is what we mean by involuntary. What is the pituitary gland? Now, pituitary gland is a small structure which is present at the base of the brain, right, which is responsible for producing hormones. And we are going to be having a class on hormones very soon, right? So don't worry about it. I'll tell you more about the pituitary gland that's probably going to happen in tomorrow, that tomorrow, right? So we'll have a class on animal hormones tomorrow. Okay, yes. So Ayush, your question is on difference between hypothalamus and midbrain. So can I quickly recall the different parts so that we'll be able to do it? Yes. So now we, these are all the different structures that we saw. We saw forebrain, which primarily includes your cerebrum, but also includes thalamus and hypothalamus. Then we had our midbrain. Then we had our hindbrain, which includes pond, cerebellum and medulla oblongata. Yes. Now, first up, we're going to quickly recall the different functions of the cerebrum that we discussed. Yes. So cerebrum, of course, as we know, makes up two third of our brain. Right. And we see that it has important functions. So it controls some sensory functions such as, you know, in getting the sensory information. And then, of course, such as hearing and smell and vision. Then, of course, we see that there is, um, it is also responsible for regulating various cognitive functions such as thinking and problem solving that is there, right? And often we say that the cerebrum is the site of intelligence or it's the seat of intelligence and 
consciousness. Now, consciousness that is there is how aware that we are of our surroundings, right? We tell, right? We have to be conscious of our surroundings or we say that is your conscience telling you this? Have you heard of these things? Yes? How many of you have heard about this? I, we will be doing that class smart collection 360. We will be doing that. So don't worry. Alright. I will tell you what happens. But very quickly can you give me the answer? Crazy gamer, like I told you, we've already had a class on tissues. Ankita ma'am just took it. You can go check it out in the, in the you know, playlist that is there. Right, so consciousness is something that we obviously hear about, right? And that seat of consciousness or where that arises is of course from your cerebrum that is there. Right? Now apart from this, it is also important and it also, it act, all these things that I told you, they're all like these association functions. You would have heard this as well. Now I think Just Do It is asking me about stimulus. Stimulus is nothing but an external agent, right? Anything on the outside that triggers, right? That triggers our response within our body or that initiates an impulse, thereby we respond on it. So this was all about the cerebrum. Now, of course, we also learned that the cerebrum has two hemispheres. It has right hemisphere and it has the left hemisphere. Yes. Is our pulse an involuntary function? Yes, it is. Why should the pituitary gland be on the brain? Now, for pituitary gland and pineal gland, I am going to be taking a class very soon. Like I said, I'm going to do it tomorrow. So I will be telling you about the details of it. But why the pituitary gland is present is because the pituitary gland acts as a master gland. So the pituitary gland actually regulates, right? It regulates the functioning of other glands that are there inside the body. Now, of course, about, like we said, the thalamus that is there acts as a relay station and regulates all the sensory functions that happens, right? It's important for regulation. And the hypothalamus that is there is responsible for regulating temperature, thirst, and of course, hunger, right? So this is important to understand. Is there any specialization of left and right hemisphere? See, different parts of our brain carries out different, different functions. And even now, like I tell you, right, there's so much research that is going on. So it's very, it's very difficult for me to say hard and fast that this particular region does this. This is our understanding of it, right? And we can say that this is what it may do, right? We have a place which is there wherein you have a certain region of the brain that regulates and is the site of where vision gets processed. So it's very easy to say that this particular part does this. But I would tell you that neurology and neuroscience is something which is far more deep, far, far more deep, right? So it's important that you have the fundamental understanding of it, yes? Now, of course, the next function is that of the midbrain, right? So now, of course, when we talk about the midbrain that is there, it is the site of auditory and visual processing and, of course, helps in reflexes of the eye. Now, somebody was asking me here, ma'am, what is the difference between midbrain and hypothalamus? Midbrain regulates the reflexes of the eye, such as change in pupil size and lens. Hypothalamus is responsible for regulating hunger, thirst and temperature. Are we clear everybody with this? Now, of course, for hindbrain, we have three things. We have cerebellum, we have pons and we have medulla, right? So the cerebellum that is there is responsible for maintaining balance and body posture. Yes. And of course, when we talk about organizing all of these, you know, or motor scales, precision of voluntary functions, this is also something that the hindbrain does, but you do not need to go deeper. This is something that the pons does, but mainly pons for what you need to know. This is a little bit extra. All you need to know for pawns is it acts as a relay station or a point of contact for different parts of the brain and also helps with regulating the breathing rate. Yes. And of course, the involuntary action such as, you know, the flow of blood or pumpy heartbeat that is there, swallowing, all of those involuntary actions are taken care by the medulla. Thalamus again is a relay station for various sensory functions that are there inside the body. Yes. Are we clear everybody with the functions of the brain, the structure of the brain and the different parts? Yes. Yes, everyone, give me a quick thumbs up.
so the reason why they are saying that is because like i saw this comment here right so the ridges and grooves that are there is to accommodate the neurons and the more number of ridges and grooves they say that more is the iq which means that there's more space for memory right more space for recalling things right so that is that important to understand so this leaf like thing that you see is just a diagrammatic representation of the cerebellum yes all right so now of course very quickly before i wind up the brain and quickly take you through the functions of the spinal cord it is important to understand one thing right that is when we talk about our brain we see that it gets information from different parts of the body and it processes this information and it not only sends out what instructions it does not just tell the body what to do but a part of the brain also stores this information right so it stores this information and it is what remains as a memory right so that is how we see this happen yes how to use 100% of our brain we are still figuring that out so with this of course we have had a quick look at the brain and very quickly we will look at the spinal cord but before i go to that please hit the like button please hit that subscribe button if you are enjoying the classes that we are taking if you are enjoying how much effort that goes into every session just so we make sure that you ace your board exams then you know what to do right please make sure that you hit that like and subscribe button doesn't it contract and relax brain does not have it's not like muscles right brain is not a muscle so it's a very common misconception thinking that brain has a lot of muscles right brain actually does not have a lot of muscles it does not contract and relax but rather you can think of it like a big you know circuit that is at an electric circuit where all these you know signals are you know sort of cross firing everywhere so that is how it's going to be that today's homework link so today we will be you can just give me the homework in the chat box right in the comment section you can just do that now very quickly we are going to be looking at the spinal cord right so here when we talk about the spinal cord we know that it extends down from your medulla oblongata right so it extends down from the medulla oblongata and it is protected by your vertebral column and we see that the three important functions are the fact that it regulates body movements so we see that information from the brain gets passed down through the spinal cord reports senses so it also sends back information and of course how ankita ma'am has ta taught us already it manages our reflex actions right so reflexes below the neck are controlled by the spinal cord yes very good so this was all about spinal cord is very simple and easy right there's not much for you guys anyway but it's important to understand a little bit about it karthik topic and nastic movements come in plant coordination which i will be taking it when i do that topic okay so we will be doing that then now with this we've had a look at the central nervous system and i'm going to quickly tell you about the peripheral nervous system as well now your peripheral nervous system as the name suggests are in the periphery of your central nervous system which means you have your brain and spinal cord right from your brain and spinal cord all the nerves that emerge are called or come under peripheral nervous system now this includes your cranial nerves so you can write this down now this is mentioned very briefly but it is important to understand so you have your cranial nerves wherein you have and you have your spinal nerves right so we see here that you have both cranial and spinal now we have 12 pairs of cranial and 31 pairs of spinal nerves yes and we see that they are constantly branching out to different parts of our body to relay information from central nervous system to different parts and also carry information from different parts to the central nervous system yes are we clear yes now apart from this the next point how like karthik has already brought it up as a wonderful student we also have two other things which is your autonomic nervous system and your somatic nervous system now your somatic nervous system that is their controls or is responsible for relaying information to like your skeletal muscles or basically to parts of your body which you can control right why autonomic nervous system relays parts or our nerves which are involved in relaying information to parts of our body which we cannot control or they are involuntary yes all right 
So we are talking, see there are two ways of it. Now I know PNS has two types ma'am, somatic and autonomic, two ways of it. One is based on the nerves that emerge, right, from your CNS. That is your cranial and spinal nerves, clear? Next, based on your function, you can categorize them, yes? So we see that you have somatic nerves and you have autonomic, somatic controls voluntary and autonomic controls con has involuntary. Yes, and in autonomic, you have sympathetic and parasympathetic, but that's a little beyond your NCRT syllabus, so we are not going to cover it, all right? Very good. Bones have, bones have nerve endings in them, yes. They do. So I think Ankita ma'am has taken a class on this, right? On how bone being a connective tissue. She would have definitely spoken about this, yes? Alright everybody has the structure of the brain, the first role of the spinal cord and the central and PNS become easy for all of you, yes? Give me a quick thumbs up and we can wind it up. It's already 9 o'clock, right? So I'm sure all of you must be hungry. Some of you would have homework to do, right? So I do understand. All right, very good, yes. Okay. So very quickly everybody, before I wind up, I have a homework question for all of you. Yes, so I want all of you to tell me what are the parts that make up the hind brain, right? So this is your homework question. So parts that make up hind brain and its function. Yes. All of you must be able to write the answer in the comment section and I will be checking it so that tomorrow we can discuss. I'll be coming live tomorrow again with animal hormones, right? So be prepared, read the textbook and come. If you have any more doubts, I do know some of you had asked me for signal transduction as well. Not to worry, we'll be recalling all of it. Later on, we're going to have a lot of classes on this as well. Ankita Ma'am and I will be coming and helping you out with all of these chapters. Do not worry, tomorrow I'm coming at 8 o'clock. Yes, same time, same place. So I will be sending this on the Telegram channel. So please get subscribed. Link is there in the description box. And of course, please show us your love by liking this video, sharing it with your friends and subscribing to the channel because you know that your 9th and 10th channel has always got you covered. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for being such wonderful, wonderful students. We'll see you very soon again. Bye bye and good night and take care.